All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Liberty Radio. Welcome back for what appears to be our final broadcast from the land of endless summer, at least for the foreseeable future, because again, uh, Lord only knows what we are going to be subjected to in Los Estados Unidos over the course of the next 12 to 16 months, but it looks like I am going to be back and witnessing it all along with you. Uh, Possibly more on that later, but without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our guest for this evening. I am joined by a man that I imagine doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. And if we did ask for one, we might get something along the lines of, I'm just a black man from Exton, Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the one and only Mr. Sunday Night to the studio, Uncle Hotep. Welcome. To Liberty Radio. Yeah, happy Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Which is awesome because there's a taco stand right down the street from my house. I can go and drop five bucks and have a whole mess of tacos ready for dinner as soon as we get done. Yeah. Well, if, if you're asking for my opinion, I'm going to say yes. The only places that I've had legitimate Mexican food that I think compare to what I've had down here in the last year uh, have been uh, a couple of restaurants that I visited in New Mexico, uh, funnily enough. Uh, back in my 20s, and then also down in San Antonio. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to go and have a Sunday dinner at a friend of mine's house when we were in San Antonio, and his grandmother, who was living with them, because, again, that's, that's how they do it. They like to keep the family uh, close and together. Uh, man, it, that was hands down some of the best Mexican food I've ever had in my life. And that's really the only thing that can compare to what I can literally walk five minutes down the street and find on any given day here in Acapulco. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I've heard some stories about it lately that make it seem like it's not quite as nice as what it used to be, but that seems to be the trend with uh, Democrat-controlled cities in this country. So, oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, more and more, it seems like that's kind of what government is here to do is make sure that the people remain unsafe so that you know they essentially uh, guarantee themselves a job going forward. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump right into it then, uh, since you're right outside of Philadelphia, and I'm sure 
you know, everybody tuning in right now saw all the scenes that were coming out of Philadelphia midweek last week with uh, the riots and the looting. And of course, we all know about Meatball, right? She became as big a star as she already was. She became an even bigger star uh, when all of that went down. So what the hell is going on in Philadelphia, man? whether he should have or should have but since like we go back to george floyd and stuff like that they let them people run wild with you know looting these assholes they they the guy a, a guy got killed and they said hey let's take an opportunity to go loot you know and, and as soon as that happened they went out there and loot you know and and, and these people meatball you know she's clout chasing off of it you know, streams to 11,000 people, you know, while people break into liquor stores, while people break into Apple, you know, um, it's it's just more of the same, you know, in, in some of these cities around the country. Um, they let, they don't punish people. They don't put people in jail. They let people out and people just run amok, you know, and, and that's, that's what happens. You know, it's, 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 it's terrible. It's terrible. So since you're a little bit closer to the area where everything actually went down, I don't know, you might know a little bit more in terms of details of, of kind of what set things off and you might not. Cause again, we're all fed the same media nowadays. So it's hard to, to know what you can actually trust anymore. Um, but the story that we were being told is that there was a, a shooting by police of, I believe it was a Puerto Rican man. Um, yes, that's true. That kind of set all of the events in motion. Is that the same story that you've heard? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. The guy who the guy who was killed, he was a Puerto Rican. Um, but I, I, I mean, I'm not going to get in dive into race relations in Philadelphia. You know, I I kind of felt it shocking that you know uh, they they would ride off of that, um, you know, just for different reasons. But um, you know, the family was upset. They had they interviewed the family outside the the courthouse and stuff like that. Um, I think the police officer was really he was fired, you mm -hmm. know, but they they didn't they neglected to charge him with you know uh, you know murder charges. So I I, I kind of think the police was like, yeah, well, you shouldn't have did that. We're not gonna. We're not. We don't want you as a police officer because we. You could have handled that way better. But you know they. You know the police union is gonna take the guys back. You know they're 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 gonna oh, yeah. try to have the, the police police go to jail. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's basically what happened. Okay. Is is this something that you could potentially see happening in Philly again, like in the near future? Well, I will say this. The police had a different response than the previous riots in George Floyd. And now we have, you know, they had a female, I, I forget her name. I, I mean, you, I'm not going to be on the sexist train or whatever, but but the previous uh, police commissioner was a, uh, 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 she was light skinned female, uh, I forget her name. I think she took another job. She quit. Mm -hmm. Now they got this black man in, in, in <laughs> and it, it seemed to me from the interviews, he was like, he had a whole different, like, yo, we're not tolerating this. This is trifling. This is terrible. It seemed like he had a different opinion about this stuff happening. Like he was not going to tolerate that, you know, this stuff. And it seemed to me like just from the police response, they were, they were trying to shut it down at all costs, you know, as soon as, because, you know, Meatball, her dumbass was fucking streaming, 
the cops was like, hey, we'll, we'll see you. We see you on our phones. We got our phones right here. We've seen you. They they locked her. They got her location. Went and go locked her up. She mm -hmm. getting charged with six felonies. You know they they they, they got all, I, like and um they released mug shots of the people that was uh um uh, looting and stuff like that. I I don't think that happened previously. Um, could it happen again? Yeah, but I I kind of think um. Unless it's like a major, super major event, like this was kind of like I said, you just had people. They people weren't really outraged over the police. They just took it upon themselves to take advantage of a situation. Um, but I, I do say that I will say that it, it seemed to me the police, Philadelphia Police Department, had a different reaction this time, and they 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 didn't want to, they weren't going to tolerate it as much as they did previously. That's interesting. It it makes me wonder if Meatball is being made an example of uh, on purpose. Because again, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the grand theft world and the type of research that uh, that we do and and that we expose our audience to. Uh, but it always seems like when events like these take place there's not just one reason behind it happening you know it's always like there's four or five different things that are being accomplished and one of the things that really stands out to me is how quickly and how harshly uh, meatball was treated by the justice system and it makes me wonder if that wasn't for the purpose of sending a message to anybody else that may want to go out the next time there's an explosive event and start live streaming what's going on. You know, like it's going to make people think twice. No, you're definitely right about that. Like a lot of people were saying that on our Instagram and, yeah, and our, on our, um, in the stream, it was like, yo, they're going to make an example. Out of her. Like, she's not like, she's like, I knew a, of her just from, you know, I'm in the area, you know, just from like, uh, there's a couple Instagram feeds I follow and, you know, I wouldn't say she's a, like a celebrity. She's like a, a, a local influencer. Like some, you nine times out of 10, you, you, wanna, you knew who, who she was. And I, I wasn't even going to stream. I streamed that night and I saw a picture and I was like, is that Meatball? I was like, I couldn't believe it myself. I was like, I know Meatball's not streaming. I look, I get up and then they, they got her hemmed up and stuff like that. But yeah, um, I have no doubt in my mind they're, they're going to make an example. Of they're going to be, they're going to tighten her up if they can, you know. But I think she's she doesn't have like a record or anything, you know. So uh, she might be like she might get off lenient because of that. Like if she she had an extensive record, then you know it'd been that's her off. But she didn't have any like record or anything. She's only like twenty one years old. She never really got in her in her life. Okay. Well, I mean, it's one of those things we're just going to have to keep our eye on it and see how things develop, you know, because, again, uh, I'm sure it took most people by surprise today when uh, the Speaker of the House was summarily removed from his position, uh, or at least that's that's the uh, the headlines that I've seen so far is that that's something that took people by surprise. So uh, at this point. Uh, with what we've witnessed going down in the last few years, you know, who knows uh, what may happen tomorrow, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and there was another, uh, I don't know if you followed it, Kruger, I think. Uh, there was this leftist, I guess he was a, a journalist. And he lived in uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a different section of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And he had gotten to a back and forth with uh, Scott Adams like like a year ago. Right. And uh unfortunately the guy 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 got shot. Like he got shot seven times in seven times in his house. Oof. Like and you know, and everybody's dunking on him and stuff like that. Um but yeah, it's, it's like I don't know, seven times seems like I don't know, it doesn't seem like a random robbery or something like that. It seems like he pissed somebody off or somebody, you know meant to get him or something like that but that that's that was another story that happened in philadelphia that people were talking about this week oh yeah yeah i did see that on uh twitter today 
because there were a few people going back and forth about that. Do you know, did they ever release the caliber of bullet that he was shot with? No, they didn't release anything like like any specific details. The cops said they had no leads or anything. And I'm surprised about that because I'm like, I know there's like everybody has ring cameras now. Right. right. So I, I figured I was like, I figured a guy at least had ring cam. Right. Or his neighbors have. They didn't release anything. They didn't release no mm. pictures. Uh, no. Be on the lookout. Anything. They they released nothing. So I, I don't know what what. I don't they they have no leads in that in that in that shoot. Well, it is still fairly early. Um yeah. you know, since the event happened. So uh it could be uh likely that more details come out, you know, as as the investigation progresses and uh all of all of that blather that they usually uh spew from the podium at the press conferences. Uh I'm sure if they want us to know some you know nitty gritty little detail about it they'll it'll get splashed all over the media so that you can't avoid knowing it you know yeah yeah Yeah, definitely um looks like we're heading into more perilous times than uh what those of us who grew up in the latter half of the 20th century became accustomed to in our uh young lives And, of course, that's why Liberty Radio is here. I'm sure that's why uh, you do Hotep's Been Told You every Thursday with Hotep Jesus to, you know, help uh, get better information out to people so that they can make their own decisions about things. So that kind of leads me into the first question uh, that I wrote down that, that I thought of, which is... You know, when did you get into producing your own media? How how did that happen for you? Oh man, this has been this is about my daughter's ten. So like I would say like ten, eleven years ago, I believe. Um one thing you know, I used to um you know, I, I used to watch people on YouTube, you know, um and one guy there was this black conservative, rest in peace, David Carroll. I used to watch David Carroll and Tommy Sotomayor a lot. You know, I used to watch them religiously, you know, because I, I, you know, I jumped off watching TV. I cut the cord early. You know, I cut the cord like decades ago, right? So I was like, you know, sometimes you need some other, you know, you know, so instead of watching TV, yeah, I would watch YouTube videos and stuff like that. So I used to watch those guys religiously. Then my daughter was born, my oldest daughter was born. You know, and I always felt to myself like, you know, I need to, I don't know where, I, I kind of came with my own, but I, you know, I, I read somewhere somebody was like, you know, these videos, they were doing stuff, they were making videos, so like, they they felt like, you know, when they're gone, their daughter or their, their children could look at YouTube or wherever the videos were hosted and, you know, be like a, like a time capsule and stuff like that. You know, because so that was kind of in the back of my mind, too. So I, I kind of wanted to make videos like David and, and Tommy. But I also wanted to leave like a time capsule for my children, you know, when I'm gone. You know, because sometimes you, you, you're not going to be able to tell every, children everything, you know. And I wanted, um, it, they may not look at it. <laughs> I, I am sure, I'm sure I am going to tell them, like, yo, yo, every once in a while, you need to look at these videos, you know. Um, but. I feel like um, I wanted them to, uh, because you're not going to be able to tell children. So I feel like sometimes, you know, they could look at it and and say, and see what my thoughts on situations, and then maybe they can gather their own gather their own opinion about that subject or a different subject at, at all. But yeah, that's the reason I, you know, it's been so it was like the. Ten years that that was the reasons, and then you know, you know, Trump came. You know, twenty sixteen changed everything. You know, it was like mm-hmm. I wasn't really like big or anything like that. You know, then twenty sixteen came. I was like, screw it. You know, I was tired of everything. You know, I was like, and I, I felt like Hillary was just like, no, and I felt like Trump was. You know, he was saying the right things, you know. Um, I think he was more anti-war than the rest of 
that was my big thing, you know, because I was I was in the Air Force, you know, I felt like, you know, I, I felt like, like I didn't want a president to like, you know, I was tired of the neocon movement and things of that nature. No, so I kind of wanted to move further away from that. So I started making videos on Trump and stuff like that. I gained a little traction, um, you know, and then that that's how we got here. I think Cernovich put me in a, one of his films and stuff like like a little bit part. You know, I gained a lot of followers, that, but, you know, then it was off to the races, you know. Um, that was the that's the origin of my uh, <laughs> the Bruce Wayne origin of my uh, my uh, content creation. OK. So how was it then that you and Hotep Jesus ended up hooking up together for the Thursday night show? Man, it was just like, you know, I followed him on, on, I just started following him on Twitter and, you know, we got, we grouped together and, you know, just on some tweet stuff. It was nothing serious, but then he, he, he came up, it was like, yo, let's do a show together. I was like, bet, you know, <laughs> you know cause he wasn't really, he wasn't really in the political lane. I was more in the political lane, conservative political lane. And he'll tell you, oh, it's Uncle Hotel's fault. I got into this. But, you know, I kind of pulled him in. I was like, you know, you can talk about this. You can do this. You know what I mean? And then he took it, you know, you know, that's this is that's more his personality. You know, he's more outgoing. He's more of a marketing guy. So he took it and ran with it. But yet we just... It was just on a whim, just to start start our own show, and and then, uh, you know, it took off, uh, and you know, we've we've been doing it for, I think we have two hundred and seventy six episodes, so uh, over five years, so so uh, we've been going strong. It's been it's been um, we did three years in a row. We've done a um, we've done a live prod- podcast in Vegas every year for the last three years. Um, I never would have thought, you know, we would take it this far. You know, um, you know, we get a lot of, there's a lot of, um, uh, what's the word for it? Um, you know, oh, Jesus, well, sorry, excuse my language. Uh, no, it's all good. You can say whatever <laughs> hey, you want to here, man. No, I mean, it, like, I think we do, we're doing well, but I, I think kind of like, you know, YouTube is trying to pump the brakes, you know, yeah. you know how it is. Like, oh, yeah. if you don't. And if you're not super politically correct, they're going to step on you, right? <laughs> you're not going to try to step down any which way, you know? So we're a victim of that as well, but we're just going to keep pushing. Well, that's one of the things that I think is incredible uh, about the, the Hotep Ben Told Your product, right? Because even with all of the censorship that we're all subjected to, right, with the the visibility filtering and the throttling and the limited reach and all of that stuff, you guys, because I've been I've been following the both of you for probably close to almost four years now. Right. So I have watched uh, the the production value grow uh, as far as as the content is concerned. I have watched the audience grow over time. Um, and it does appear to be organic growth, right? It's not like y'all just showed up on the scene one day and you each had a hundred thousand followers, right? Like you can actually watch the progression over time. And I mean, I'll tell you, I think you guys together capture something that most of the other talking head shows, whether we're talking about mainstream or we're talking about independent media, like you guys have something special going. I don't know if it's like the chemistry between the two of you or what it is exactly, but there is something there that is magical that you don't get in a lot of other podcasts which is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on today and hopefully expose you to, you know, an even wider audience so that that growth can, uh, can continue. I mean, is, is that something that you're able to recognize in the moment when it's happening or is it something that you look back on and go, yeah, man, that was, that was pretty awesome. What we did tonight. Um, 
Probably a little bit of both. You know, I, I think I can definitely recognize we've grown as and and you know, you just gotta give time time, you know, sometimes. Like I remember the first two years, like if we go from the last three years from the first two years, I, I can definitely see where our chemistry grew and you know, we just got better at it. You know, um, you know, I, I think I have no I was never like a naturally outgoing guy, you know, but you know, with practice. Anybody can do can be a lot better than what they they were, you know. So I think, uh, um, and plus we offer different like different takes because I I kind of think we like some of the some of the subject matter isn't a joking matter, but we uh, we kind of find a way to have humor with it, you know. Um, and I think we just have a different take on it, you know. But I, I definitely agree, you know. We uh, our chemistry has grown a lot. You know, and, and we've just grown as people, you know what I mean? We've been doing it for five years, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's just, it just helped. It's just, you know, um, it just, you just got to work on stuff, you know? So in the, we'll, we'll just call it an even 10 years, right? In the 10 years that, that you've been doing work on the independent media scene, what do you think is the biggest change that you've seen in the landscape in that time? Man, it was like, I would say in the first four years, I, I would say until 2017, it was like the wild, wild west. Like anybody could like get on it, like, you know, you could get some traction and stuff like that. And I, I think after 2017, I think uh, the elites, the powers that be, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, they said, hey, man, we got to get our feet in the game, right? Like, I think they got caught off guard. Like, <laughs> they, they, like they, did, they were like, they all of a sudden, like, their voice wasn't as valuable as they're used to having. So after that, I feel like, you know, the they, they, they started throttling content and then they started putting their own people out there. You know, and even to start pushing their own people out there. So it's not as organic as it used to be. You know, there's a lot of money behind the scenes or certain people, you know. Um, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, but I mean, we can all, we can probably tell. But that's the biggest, that's the biggest change from when, <coughs> well, I'm sorry, excuse me, when I started. You know, I think the I think the uh, the powers that be, the big business, is a lot more involved in independent media than they were before. Mm. Yeah, and I would absolutely uh, agree with you on that. I think uh, their reach into independent media productions is probably even deeper than what we suspect it might be, because it it seems like that's the pattern, right? is you find out that these people are involved in these things and you're like, all right, well, they're probably just like giving them money. And then of course you go on, you learn more, you find out more details and you discover, oh, it's actually a lot more orchestrated uh, than what I first thought it was. Or at least that's that's been uh, my pattern whenever I go and re research something that I don't know a whole lot about. So with that being the biggest change in the media landscape in the last 10 years, do you think that that has been the most important change as well? Or has that been something completely different? You know, it's hard to say it is definitely important, you know, um, cause I feel like the elites probably said, Hey, we got to change this because you know, these people are getting too red pilled or getting like they're getting too exposed to stuff. Um, yeah, I would probably say that would probably be one of the most important things, you know, um, I could, I, I kind of think that allowed them to get, uh, get somewhat control back, um, you know, uh, of how it used to be for that. Cause if, if you realize you just think about it, like it used to be just mainstream media would tell, they would tell the populace whatever they want, you know. There was independent media and stuff like that. You know, they had newsletters and books and radio shows, but that was not the internet was on a larger, such a broader scale, you know. Mm -hmm. So you could really reach a lot of people like instantly where you couldn't before. You're like, 
but like before, if you wanted to read a conspiracy book, you would have to go to the library and hopefully they would have the book, you know, and things of that nature. But now you can just go on YouTube or go on um, somebody's podcast and, you know, listen on, and listen what you want to listen to. You know, I think the podcast is, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's here to stay. You know, people are like saying like, oh, there's too many podcasts. Like, no, I don't. I, I don't. There's not enough. To be honest with you, you know what I mean? I think I think everybody has a voice. You know, that's the one thing I wanted, you know, you asked me about what how I got into this. You know, like everybody has a voice. You know, I want my voice heard and stuff like that. Um, you might not um, you know, it with the internet, there's you can reach millions and billions of people, you know what I mean? But you there's like if you put your you're not gonna know who agrees with you until you put it out there, you know. So that's, you know, that's another reason why, you know, I started doing contests. Well, and it also helps when you get that feedback from the audience that, you know, they say, hey, I've been thinking about this too, or I see that the same way. I, I completely understand what you're saying here. Like that validation that you get back, um, you know, some people use it to feed their ego, which of course is, is something that it can be employed for. But yeah. the, the thing about that interaction that's always been uh, more important to me is just being able to make that connection to somebody else. Because again, we're, we're supposed to exist in a reality where we're at odds with one another, right? We're supposed to be divided against one another and hating each other for whatever petty reason it is uh, that we can find at the moment. And when you can actually make that connection to somebody else and, you know, potentially even open a dialogue with them, that negates like all all of the the work that's being done by the propaganda and you know so uh, again i agree with you we need more people doing this exact thing right here like what you and i are doing because in my mind it's the only way that we're going to have an advantage in the information war yes yes you ready so all right silly question for you uh we'll we'll skip gears here because i think uh you know we can we can pretty much say you're you're internet famous at this point right <laughs> there's there's even people in my audience which is is rather small all right but when i said hey i'm gonna be having uncle hotep on for an interview i got several messages back you know letting me know how cool people thought that was so when you're out and about living your normal life, do you get recognized as Uncle Hotep out in public? Um, not like it's only happened a couple of times. I went to the beach one time and it was like, yo, oh. like I didn't know who it was. It wasn't first, you know what I'm saying? So, like, yes, it, you know, we went somewhere else then. So I said, yeah, I listen to your stuff all the time. This happened a few times. Like it's it's kind of weird, you know what I mean? I, I wasn't like, you know, I don't I don't do I didn't never did it for that. You know, I'm not, right. you know, I don't do it for my ego, you know, or anything like that. You know, I just um I just do it for like, you know, like I said, for my kids and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I then then like I might know people like what happens a lot though is like people that don't know i did do any of this stuff like all of a sudden they discover it mm. and then i see them again they're like yo i listen to your podcast man that's great man i'm like oh. I, I never expected these people to listen because like if you, if you look at our audience you wouldn't expect them i'm like yo well, that's cool and shit like that that happens a lot too so um you know every once in a while i get recognized but you know more what happens a lot is like people that have been on my Facebook friends list or Instagram friends list, they all of a sudden they discover the podcast. And then they're like, next time I see them, they tell me about it. Shit like that. So when, when those couple of times uh, have happened for you, 
Did, did you, were you able to like have a conversation with that person for a few minutes or, or was it just like a, a very brief interaction? Yeah, I usually just sit there and talk for a little few minutes, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, one guy was telling me like, you know, I didn't like, I never, like, I agree with a lot. A lot of times they would say like, I agree with a lot with stuff you should get you guys be saying and stuff like that. So yeah, um, usually sit down and chop it up for a few minutes. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cause I know there's, there's plenty of, I guess we'll call them internet personalities that, uh, doesn't seem like they would be gracious enough to do that. Um, and again, I'm not gonna, not gonna name any names and call anybody else out. They know who they are. Um, but yeah, that's. I mean, I, I think that kind of goes with their personality. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's probably just the person, the people they are, um, with or without the fame. You know, I, I just, I was never that guy. You know, I, I was, I was only child. I got, I got a brother and a sister, but I never, I didn't grow up with them and stuff like. So I grew up by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't. I didn't know. Like, I didn't do any of this for like to be famous or anything like that. You know, I, I didn't, I like, I don't know, you could take it, you know. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's annoying. Mm. You know, sometimes it's like, sometimes there's stuff I can't say because, you know, um, some people try to dox me before. I've had that happen before, to me before. Really? Yeah, yeah. What what happened <laughs> yeah. there? Or, or do like, you want to talk I, about it? Like, this this one author, she had uh, like this is back in the days when people Twitter was a little bit wide open. And I used to comment on some of the articles she wrote because it was ridiculous, right? Then, like I had put a, a family photo on Instagram of my family because you know we all dressed up in the Christmas pajamas. Oh, oh she did that. Somehow I got back to her. She put it on all her fucking fan. All her friends, uh, all her Twitter feed, right? Then people just just went on. Uh, people were, I was like, you know, there's a saying. Nerd Ness says there's a saying on Twitter. He's like, yo, one day Twitter comes for you eventually, mm -hmm. and that was the day they came for me, right? So it was like two days. Everybody was fucking giving me hell. Then one day, like the sec that second day. I go on you my YouTube comments and people start leaving comments on YouTube comments. And then somebody said, I hate to see you, your job. And they like like where I was employed at the time. They I hate to have them find out about it. I was, I was fucking I was shook. I was like, oh shit. I fucking deleted all my fucking tweets. <laughs> oh, wow. I deleted LinkedIn because I figured they like they must have figured out through my LinkedIn or something like that. But yeah, like, and this is what I really didn't say anything. You know, so I, like some of the times I don't like I don't really say no. I, I am, um, you know, a Patreon that we let loose a little bit on our. We got a Patreon show every Monday night. You know, on Thursday night. You know, I, I keep it. Try to, I say a lot of the stuff that's on my mind, but some of the stuff I just hold back because you know, once you leave, people start being jerks about shit. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, I've I've already experienced some of that myself, which I'm sure is is probably no surprise, because it seems like whenever you can uh, find yourself a niche, it's always accompanied with some hate, right? Yeah. It, it's yeah, it's just definitely. like part of the package. You have to accept it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah. I'm still waiting for Twitter to come for me, though. I'll I'll <laughs> actually be happy. Uh, when that day comes, and I'll just get it over and done with. Uh, yeah, it, it only it only happens really once. Like they'll come for you one time, then it's over. You you, you know they they'll come for you eventually. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, they can bring it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> so, when it comes to history, because I think I've listened to you long enough uh, to come to the understanding that uh, you are a fan of history correct? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. So, uh, a lot of people like to use the term, uh, conspiracy to describe what I call alternative history, which are the other narratives about events that occurred in our world that are not supported. 
by the mainstream. All right. So I'm talking about things like, uh, you know, some people believe we never went to the moon. Right. Or some people believe that the earth is flat. Uh, or like I believe that the Nazis won World War II. Right. These are the things that I consider alternative history. What is your favorite alternative history story? Oh, man, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it would have to be between JFK and the moon. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't really know. I don't really know what my moon take is. All I know is. I was born in 73. I'd never seen it. You know, I've been waiting for them to go back. You know, um, I kind of don't believe. You know, it's it's hard for me to believe. Now, this is just my take. It's hard for me to believe they they fucking went there, videotapes, blah blah blah, golf cart. You know what I mean? Come on, like I, I, I just. And then I, I look at the the vehicle they went in. I'm like, come on, man, stop, right? So <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. And then um, you know, JFK. You know what I mean? Come on, man. That, that's you know, like nobody. Like I wouldn't say nobody, but like I remember they did a a a poll about that. Um, and like I forget it was like sixty percent of Americans didn't believe mm-hmm. the lone comment theory. You know, um. No, I really don't believe that at all. Um, you know, it seemed to me there was more than one shooter. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't know why. I mean, there's there's a lot of theories why, you know. Um, but the bigger question is like, no, I don't think Oswald did that. I don't think he did that at all, you know. And, I mean, those are my, those are my big ones. Um, I, all right, I'll say this. Probably a big one is uh, Reagan. I believe um, what's his name? Um, who's the guy that shot Reagan? Oh, uh, Hinckley. John Hinkley. Hinkley. That was MK Ultra. I oh, think yeah. that's it. He was brainwashed. He like I think they just didn't they just let him out like like yeah. I, I, a couple years yeah. ago I think. Yeah, I think that was MK. Oh yeah, I can follow you on that. Absolutely. I mean, if you if you actually dig into the second half of the 20th century and like all the violent crimes that were being committed by various people during that time, I mean, I'm talking about like the Ted Bundys and uh the the Jeffrey Dahmers and all the way back, right? Like there's a considerable amount of evidence to show that these people were messed with psychologically over the course of their lives in order to turn them into the exact type of person that they turned out to be. Like uh, right now I'm reading uh, Dave McGowan's program to kill and he's talking about like all of that stuff and linking it back to intelligence ties and government programs uh, and all different sorts of stuff. Um, so that that would not be a stretch for me to believe at all. Um, I could I could totally get behind that. But speaking of the uh, the JFK assassination, uh, I do remember you um, putting in a few of your podcasts a couple of years back that you read The Devil's Chessboard the unauthorized autobiography of Alan Dulles. Yeah. yeah. What was it in the course of going through that book that you think um, surprised you the most uh, about Alan Dulles? Man, them guys would do anything, you know? They would do anything. You know, it, you know, they, uh, whether it's, you know, bringing over, you know, the Nazis over, you know, to help, you know, some of their stuff to, uh, search in the world for, uh, you know, uh, stuff they could use to brainwash using LSD, giving LSD to 
to her coworkers and stuff like that. Um, that's you know what I mean like, you know I, that's that was amazing. You know that's right. like not amazing in a good way, but it's just like that's that's the type of stuff that was going on in him. You know, and people like I would say the majority of Americans don't even understand that. Like, there's some really dark spots in our history, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, we did some bad things. Now, maybe that's the price of running an empire. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, there's an argument that can be made for that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and all the time they try to kill, but also like some of their incompetence. Like what? What did they? They tried to kill Castro. They what? What did they try to put poison in his boots? It was like it was something like the, that. It was the, some of the dumbest stuff I ever heard. I'm like, why would they even? Do that? Like I'm thinking in my mind, like, come on, man. Of course now I know why. Like, well, I, I want to see this. I think the Castro thing proved they're not infallible either. No, I I kind of we kind of get this like oh there's the Charlie boys and stuff like that. But then when you read like with how they tried to, you know, do Castro and they could never do it, you know, it's like maybe like in some in some instances, they're not as, you know, invincible as as, as portrayed. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems the popular theory that is making the rounds now about JFK. And again, I don't necessarily buy into or disbelieve this theory. I think you can make an argument for or against it, but that was that it was actually the mob that carried out a hit on JFK and the CIA knew about it ahead of time, allegedly, but were powerless to stop it. And again, I don't know how much of that I actually believe because when you look at what the intelligence agencies were trying to accomplish and you understand that JFK was literally sitting like a roadblock, you know, in front of their progress. It, I don't know. To me, it's always been kind of obvious that he was a direct threat to their existence. Right. Uh, And that was one of the many reasons why he had to go. Yeah. I mean, you know, and you also got to look at, you know, sometimes the Charlie boys, they, they like you could almost make the point make a uh a, a, a case that the mob in in the Charlie Boys is like one and almost the same. same in certain instances yeah. how they used each other or or they were using each other using them you know so that's the yeah, I mean that's you could make an argument for that 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 uh, that theory yeah well I mean there's there's evidence to support that going all the way back to Operation Underworld in the 1930s. You know, and folks who have never heard of that before should uh, definitely look into it and find out a little bit more about the collusion that was brought about between the government and organized crime. Like these, there are documents that you can go and find yourself, people. They're out there. They're just waiting for you to find them. So I know that you like to read, Unc. So what are you reading right now? Um, I'm reading, I kind of slow down, but I'm reading currently the, I'm trying to get through, um, uh, Whitney Webb's, um, one nation under blackmail. Excellent. Um, um it's, it's been interesting, you know, it, like the thing is like, if you go this down this path of reading these type of books, you're going to get some of the information over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Like, like the last three or four books, I've heard some of these some of these tidbits, but that only reinforces it in your brain. You know what I mean? So like some of the stuff I've heard, I've heard in, in numerous times, but this is the, this is the um, one nation under blackmail, you know, cause I've been following Whitney and she seems like she knows a lot, you know, on, on, um, on, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been following her a little bit and, you know, I'm still trying to, I need to go back. I, I lie too big to fail. That was about, uh, Robert Kennedy. Yeah. How they hey, how they did him in too. That was another that's another conspiracy mm-hmm. that I found. 
Well, it seems like that time period in American history was just full of conspiracies for some reason. It's just it was that that time on the calendar, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, interesting. Um, but yeah, I I read uh, One Nation Under Blackmail just about a year ago, uh, right okay. right when the the digital copies first came out. Um, because we were doing a book club in Grand Theft World uh, around those two volumes and and methodically going through them. Uh, and it was amazing to me the amount of detail that she was able to include while laying out this story of this blackmail network that was, you know, essentially built over the course of about 20, 25 years or so, or so, and then steadily reinforced as more time went by. And to me, when you look at organizations like, oh, I don't know, we'll throw a Church of Scientology out there just as a generic example, you can see like all the earmarks of these, uh, these black nail networks in you know what it what we're supposed to believe is a religious organization and like for me i get to the point where i'm like all right well i see this here and i see this here and they look like the exact same thing so are they the exact same thing right you know and it just seems like as as I gather more details about our history, like that pattern keeps repeating itself until I get to the point where I'm like, all right, well, you know, what is, what is actually real then? What is actually true? Like yeah. I would imagine at some point you've gotten to that point as well. And I mean, how did you, how did you resolve that moment or have you gotten to that point? Um, Man, you don't know what's you don't know what's true or what's not, you know. Um I would say I would say I'm lucky enough, but growing up with my dad, you know, um he was a skeptic. Like I remember I had asked him numerous times. I was like, Dad, we go to the moon. He's like, That's what they say. That was his answer. That's what they say. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and then the JFK thing, like, they, they shoot JFK? And then he went on a story. He was like, yo, they got these sharpshooters to recreate the shot. None of them can do it. Like, he wouldn't tell me what he thought. But, you know, he, 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 he expressed doubt. You know, so I've had doubt in certain things, you know, since I was a kid. But, you know, we live in a land where, you know, you know, it, expressing these ideas will get you like, I don't know, looked at crazy and worse. At the least. Yeah, at least, at the very least, that's, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's more helpful now, the Internet era, because you, you're going to be able to find people, like-minded people. You know, uh, it's not as like closed as it used to be, you know, um, but that's a that's a great, you know, question, you know, um, because it's, you know, I, I think you have to have a little bit. I don't care what other people think, you know, um, you know, just think whatever you want to believe, you know, um, because. I mean, let's just look at the, well, the last couple of years, what we went through. Some people aren't even going to believe that, you know, the government could do such a thing with the lockdowns and everything else. You know, and in, the, in the world I grew up in, yeah, they, of course they could. Like, you know what I mean? Like, some people, we, some people, you, some people would never believe it. They'll never, they'll go to their graves now. Like, I mean, you can't, like, I try to, you know, hopefully you can touch some of these people and you just open some of their eyes, but there's going to be people that never, you know, until like they've had something massive happen in their life or something like that, you know, they're not, some people just going to live in La La Land, you know, and there's nothing really you can do about it. 
Yeah. The, the phrase I hear most often is most people won't recognize what's happening until it shows up on their doorstep. And of course, at that point, it's too late because they're not going to be able to do anything about it. Yeah. All right, Unc. Well, I do appreciate you joining us today, and I'm going to respect your time as we're uh, coming up on the top of the five o'clock hour here in Acapulco. Uh, so I'll go ahead and pull out my final question for you now, which is, uh, and this may be the heaviest one uh, that I've asked today, where do you think the country is headed? You know, like, what do you think the U.S. is going to look like 10 years from today? Man, I hate to say it. Uh, I kind of think. Uh, we might be a little bit worse than we are right now, you know. Um, I kind of think they'll try to make some inroads on digital, you know, digital uh, currency and stuff like that. Um, I just think. You know, the difference between the have and the have nots is going to be even bigger uh, 10 years from now. And I, I hate to be a, like a black pillar or something like that. Uh, I just I just feel like, um, you know, I think the elites are want to have a changing of the guard. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I don't think the United States is going to be the, the leading power in the world. Um, you know, I think that's going to be land in the east somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. But I will say the American people are resilient, you know, um, and, you know, I, I, I do say on my show, like the history of the world's already been bought, but, you know, I mean, we can almost also write our own history, you know, so it's not, you know, bigger plans have been foiled, you know, so it, I think it's going to be up to us, you know what I mean? So, but we're going to have, it's going to have to make some hard sacrifice for the people, you know, it's not going to come easy. Yeah. I, I agree with you that it is not going to come easy. Um, I mean, we've we've had it rough all the way up till now. You know, those of us who are not a part of the privileged elite, we're the ones that, that always end up with uh, the, the footprints on our back, right? We're, we're the ones that the foundation gets built on top of so that they can then have the, the big, beautiful plantation home on top of that. Uh, and I think you're right. It's going to be up to us, the ones who actually have the strength of will to speak up about what is going on instead of being timid and quiet and part of the crowd. Like we're the ones who are going to end up moving the needle at the end of the day, much to the chagrin of the global elite, I think, uh, cause the way I see things unfolding is it's going to be pretty much like what we've already had, right? It's going to be that totalitarian two-step where we take two steps forward and then one step back and two steps forwards, rinse and repeat, right? And eventually they'll get close to where they want to be, but it won't be exactly the way that they planned it. It's going to be some bastardized version with, you know, band-aids and and rubber bands and however the hell else they've been able to put the contraption together. Right. Um, But yeah, I think, I think our role in standing as opposition uh, for this agenda is probably what's going to allow us to be hopefully in something that resembles a favorable situation, you know, by the time we hit 2030, because again, they have their road mark, uh, their roadmap and their, their landmarks laid out. They know where they're trying to get to. They think they know what it's supposed to look like. It's to them. It's just a matter of time. But the, the one thing that I've seen from these people you know, in the, in the studies that I've done from their writings and looking at history and all of that is it never turns out exactly the way they intended to. So that means that there is some component that they cannot account for. And why can't that be us? I think it should be us. It can be. It definitely can be. 
Yeah, I think you're right about that. Well, Ankh, uh, definitely massive gratitude to you for taking the time to join us on Liberty Radio today. I have had a blast. Yeah, and, me too. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, anytime you want to come back, just let me know and uh, we'll get it set up. Okay. Awesome. Well, folks, if you have not been tuning in for Hotep's Been Told You on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, this is your notice to start doing it because there's other stuff you can watch at uh, 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, but it's not going to be nearly as entertaining as what uh, Unk and HJ put on. Um, Uncle Hotep, uh, any uh, last words you want to get in or uh, any place that you want to direct folks to to get more of your content? No, you can um, you know, follow uh, me and uh, HJ on Twitter. Uh, I think he's Hotep Jesus on Twitter and I'm Uncle Hotep on Twitter uh, every Thursday night on uh, Hotep Jesus YouTube channel uh, 8 o'clock. We have a, a about two and a half hours, sometimes three hour podcast. Um, we also have a Patreon. Uh, we do an extra show every Monday nights. Uh, that's Patreon only uh, to cover some other stuff on, on uh, around the world. But hey, uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate you uh, uh, taking your time to have me on. I appreciate that, man. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to talk to you about like you moving to, to Mexico and, and stuff like that. And I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, sure, man. Once once things settle down for me, uh, we'll get back together and, and we'll talk all about that because I need to get a lot of that stuff out of my head once I get over on the other side of the border. So I'm not thinking about it anymore. Yeah, OK. <laughs> all right.